We close, as we always do on Fridays, with another reading from the works of the American humorist James Thurber. This week's offering dates to 1937 and Thurber's book, Let Your Mind Alone. I'm reading it from James Thurber, 92 Stories, published by Longmeadow in 1985. Nine Needles by James Thurber. One of the more spectacular minor happenings of the past few years, which I am sorry that I missed, took place in the Columbus, Ohio home of some friends of a friend of mine. It seems that a Mr. Albatross, while looking for something in his medicine cabinet one morning, discovered a bottle of a kind of patent medicine, which his wife had been taking for a stomach ailment. Now, Mr. Albatross is one of those apprehensive men who are afraid of patent medicines and of almost everything else. Some weeks before, he had encountered a paragraph in a consumer's research bulletin which announced that this particular medicine was bad for you. He had thereupon ordered his wife to throw out what was left of her supply of the stuff and never buy any more. She had promised, and here now was another bottle of the perilous liquid. Mr. Albatross, a man given to quick rages, shouted the conclusion of the story at my friend. I threw the bottle out the bathroom window and the medicine chest after it. It seems to me that must have been a spectacle worth going a long way to see. I am sure that many a husband has wanted to wrench the family medicine cabinet off the wall and throw it out the window, if only because the average medicine cabinet is so filled with mysterious bottles and unidentifiable objects of all kinds that it is a source of constant bewilderment and exasperation to the American male. Surely, the British medicine cabinet and the French medicine cabinet and all the other medicine cabinets must be simpler and better ordered than ours. It may be that the American habit of saving everything and never throwing anything away, even empty bottles, causes the domestic medicine cabinet to become as cluttered in its small way as the American attic becomes cluttered in its major way. I have encountered few medicine cabinets in this country which were not pack-jammed with something between 150 and 200 different items, from dental floss to boracic acid, from razor blades to sodium perborate, from adhesive tape to coconut oil. Even the neatest wife will put off clearing out the medicine cabinet on the ground that she has something else to do that is more important at the moment or more diverting. It was in the apartment of such a wife and her husband that I became enormously involved with a medicine cabinet one morning not long ago. I had spent the weekend with this couple. They live on East 10th Street near 5th Avenue. Such a weekend has left me reluctant to rise up on Monday morning with bright and shining face and go to work. They got up and went to work, but I didn't, I didn't get up until about 2.30 in the afternoon. I had my face all lathered for shaving and in the wash bowl was full of hot water when suddenly I cut myself with the razor. I cut my ear. Very few men cut their ears with razors. But, on the other hand, I was one of them. Possibly because I was taught the old Spencerian free wrist movement by my writing teacher in the grammar grades. The ear bleeds rather profusely when cut with a razor and is difficult to get at. More angry than hurt, I jerked open the door of the medicine cabinet to see if I could find a styptic pencil. And out fell, from the top shelf, a little black paper packet containing nine needles. It seems that this wife kept a little paper packet containing nine needles on the top shelf of the medicine cabinet. The packet fell into the soapy water of the wash bowl, where the paper rapidly disintegrated, leaving nine needles at large in the bowl. I was, naturally enough, not in the best condition, either physical or mental, to recover nine needles from a wash bowl. No gentleman who has lather on his face and whose ear is bleeding is in the best condition for anything, even something involving the handling of nine large blunt objects. It did not seem wise to me to pull the plug out of the wash bowl and let the needles go down the drain. I had visions of clogging up the plumbing system of the house, and also a vague fear of causing short circuits somehow or other. I know very little about electricity, and I don't want to have it explained to me. Finally, I groped very gently around the bowl and eventually had four of the needles in the palm of one hand and three in the palm of the other, two I couldn't find. If I'd thought quickly and clearly, I wouldn't have done that. A lathered man whose ear is bleeding and who has four wet needles in one hand and three in the other hand may be said to have reached the lowest known point of human efficiency. There is nothing one can do but stand there. I tried transferring the needles in my left hand to the palm of my right hand, but I couldn't get them off my left hand. Wet needles cling to you. In the end, I wiped the needles off onto a bath towel which was hanging on a rod above the bathtub. 
It was the only towel that I could find. I had to dry my hands afterward on the bath mat. Then I tried to find the needles in the towel. Hunting for seven needles in a bath towel is the most tedious occupation I have ever engaged in. I could find only five of them. With the two that had been left in the bowl, that meant there were four needles in all missing, two in the wash bowl and two others lurking in the towel or lying in the bathtub under the towel. Frightful thoughts came to me of what might happen to anyone who used that towel or washed his face in the bowl or got into the tub if I didn't find the missing needles. Well, I didn't find them. I sat down on the edge of the tub to think and I decided finally that the only thing to do was wrap up the towel in newspaper and take it away with me. I also decided to leave a note for my friends explaining as clearly as I could that I was afraid there were two needles in the bathtub and two needles in the wash bowl and that they had better be careful. I looked everywhere in the apartment, but I could not find a pencil, a pen, or a typewriter. I could find pieces of paper, but nothing with which to write on them. I don't know what gave me the idea, a movie I had seen perhaps, or a story I had read, but I suddenly thought of writing a message with a lipstick. The wife might have an extra lipstick lying around, and if so, I concluded it would be in the medicine cabinet. I went back to the medicine cabinet, began poking around in it for a lipstick, and I saw what I thought looked like the metal tip of one. I got two fingers around it and began to pull gently. It was under a lot of things. Every object in the medicine cabinet began to slide. Bottles broke in the wash bowl and on the floor. Red, brown, and white liquids spurted. Nail files, scissors, razor blades, and miscellaneous objects sang and clattered and tinkled. I was covered with perfume, peroxide, and cold cream. It took me half an hour to get the debris all together in the middle of the bathroom floor. I made no attempt to put anything back in the medicine cabinet. I knew it would take a steadier hand than mine and a less shattered spirit. Before I went away, only partly shaved, and abandoned the shambles. I left a note saying that I was afraid there were needles in the bathtub and the wash bowl, and that I had taken their towel, and that I would call them up and tell them everything. I wrote it in iodine with the end of a toothbrush. I have not yet called them up, I am sorry to say. I have neither found the courage nor thought up the words to explain what happened. I suppose my friends believe that I deliberately smashed up their bathroom and stole their towel. I don't know for sure, because they have not yet called me up either. Nine Needles. That's Countdown, Portions Written by James Thurber.